Thank you all for, for showing up at my, uh, my talk. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Peter Mossmans, and I want to talk about privacy. So what exactly is privacy? Uh, I personally define privacy as the right to be left alone. The right, if I talk to somebody, that nobody can listen in on that conversation. The right, if I talk to somebody, that nobody knows that I'm listening in, that I'm talking to that person, so that I stay anonymous. Privacy is a very big field. Um, today I want to talk a little bit on online privacy. And with online privacy, I mean communication between a client, in most instances a browser, and a server. So it's all about online communications today. Um, the title of the talk, Embracing the Impact, is uh, with regards to Edward Snowden. Hopefully you all know him. Uh, he made some great uh, revelations last year. And a lot of people were very shocked about what certain government agencies were actually listening in on to. Um, not everybody was aware that our privacy was, uh, the state of our privacy was that bad. And I think with those revelations, we really have to embrace the fact um, that these facts are known and try to do some things about it, try to improve the current situation of our privacy. Excuse me. Sorry, I'll, I'll, you couldn't usually ask this at the beginning of the talk. Yeah. Um, but given the talk is about privacy, do you mind your photo being taken? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you ask it, ah, that's, that's the best question ever. Yes, yes please, thanks. Okay. It, as long as you don't share it. <laughs> um, I really, personally, I really like interactive talks, so if you have any questions with regards to photographs, autographs, everything, please ask in between so I can uh, try to uh, make some things clearer. Um, a little bit of my myself. Uh, I mainly work as a web application penetration tester, which is a fancy word for hacker. I get paid to uh, break into other people's systems, uh, web applications, etc. Of course, only when asked to do so. I'm really passionate about uh, freedom, online freedom, and I guess everybody in this room is because we're at the open source conference, and I'm really into American IPAs. With IPAs, I do not mean the free IPA uh, thingy <laughs> that's a talk about later on uh, this conference. I mean the India pill ill type. A little bit on my talk, um, I divided it up into four levels. Once again, I'm talking about online privacy, and I want to look at the traffic from a browser's perspective, right into your local area network, to the internet, and to the server. So I divided it up into four different segments to look where exactly you leak personal identifiable information. Finally, if there's some, still some time, I want to look at two tool, open source tools, Tor and Tails, which can you use to enhance your online privacy. This was my car in Europe, broken into. I should have known. Um, usually when you uh, work in the information security field, you start with uh, threat modeling. You're looking at the assets you're trying to protect, for instance, the information that you want to keep private, and you're looking at the kind of attacker. Um, an attacker can be, for instance, your neighbor, it can be your boss, it can be another company, it can be a state-sponsored entity. Uh, I'm not going to delve deep into that fact, I'm just briefly touching on all the points. I'm not looking at certain situations, whether it's a, a person in your network or a state-sponsored entity, I'm just looking briefly at all steps. it doesn't rain that often in Queensland. Suppose it rained and it walked into this building, I would have left some wet footprints. You could see my footprints, and these footprints couldn't be used to identify myself, me, against, well, how do you say that? The footprints could be used to identify me. I could see those footprints, and I could clean those footprints up, thereby erasing, more or less, my identity. I also touched the door handle, thereby leaving fingerprints. The fingerprints can also be used, using specialized equipment, to trace it back to me. The big difference between the two is you can see your footprints. It's a little bit more difficult to see your fingerprints. 
I think it's really important to know where you leave footprints behind and where you leave fingerprints behind and that you're aware when you're using, when you're browsing some websites, where you are leaving finger and footprints behind. The first level, your browser. Um, there are basically two ways of fingerprinting, trying to identify yourself, uh, a user for a browser. Uh, the first one is probably known to everybody, it's uh, by means of cookies. A server actively sends out a packet, ask your browser to store that information and each time you visit that website it will return that cookie thereby positively identifying yourself. The second one is that uh, JavaScript uh, for instance queries your browser thereby trying to uniquely identify your browser. Another method is passive fingerprinting where no uh, active thing will be done. It's just by looking at the IP, TCP or HTTP protocol headers, which also can be used to identify somebody. I want to give a small example of the, the first two, active fingerprinting. Hopefully everything goes well. There we go. Okay. I download a, a, a fresh Mozilla Firefox installation, which is an open source browser, which you probably all know. I'm going to create a new profile so that you, you're sure that no um, special uh, cookies are there or special plugins. I'm going to create a fresh profile. Create profile. Yep, yep, yep. All good. Finish. And on the background, here we are. I have a network sniffer. A network sniffer is an application which can be used to passively sniff all the traffic that's passing through your network card. You can use it, for instance, for uh, administrative purposes, but also to look what kind of traffic your browser is generating or what kind of traffic you pick up from a server. Wireshark is probably the most well-known um, network sniffer. It's an open source tool and it runs on most operating systems. On the background, I'm going to start my network sniffer. As, as you can see, I use a filter now that I only see uh, traffic which is, has the HTTP protocol and has port 80 in it, which should be more or less the same. Where's my mousey? There it is. So I started my sniff on the background. And I'm going to start Firefox. You now will see all kinds of traffic originating from my browser to the internet. This is currently the fingerprint or the footprint actually I'm leaving behind when I use the browser. The first thing I want to show you is um, fingerprinting by using looking at the characteristics of the browser itself. And before that I'm going to a special uh, website which is run by the Electronic Frontier Foundation which is a non-governmental organization which helps defending or protecting online freedom. Has anybody ever heard of the site? Panopticlick? Perfect. If I haven't made any typos, there we should go. Nope. This is the one I meant. So once again, this is an application being run by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is meant to um, show you how uniquely identifiable this particular browser instance is. And once again, it's a fresh browser installation. I'm going to click on the test me button. I'm running from my personal hotspot. 
That's why it's so extremely fast. And currently, it says that among the approximately 4.6 million browsers, can everyone read the screen? Among the 4.6 million browsers, this browser is unique. And why is it unique? I'm using a fairly generic operating system, Windows, sorry, and I'm using a fairly generic uh, browser, and still I'm uniquely identifiable. And if you look a little bit further, how's that possible? It's because uh, JavaScript is allowed to look at the time zone of my machine. It's allowed to look at the screen resolutions, which makes it unique. It's allowed to look at the, the, all the different fonts I've installed. So all these different things make it that my browser is currently more or less uniquely identifiable. So even though it's a fresh browser, even though I haven't installed anything, still it's possible to identify me using my browser. The second thing I want to show you is um, how, you, how difficult it can be to get rid of cookies. Has anyone heard of the EverCookie? EverCookie is more or less a system where uh, a cookie tries to uh, be as persistent as possible. It tries to actively to uh, detect or prevent evasion or removal. It does it by using several methods. I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But it, I just want to show you how difficult it is to remove that cookie. So once again, I go to the test site. This is based on an um, open source implementation of EverCookie, which can be found on GitHub. And just for demonstration purposes, it generates a unique identifier for my browser, which is now 71. I'm going to close this tab, and I'm going to try three different methods of trying to erase the cookie from my system. I personally don't like the new Firefox user interface. It's a bit quirky. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is remove all HTTP cookies. Whoop, all my cookies are gone. The second method I'm going to use is by clearing my offline cache. There we go, cache emptied. And the third method I'm going to use is to delete all offline web content and user data. So this should be enough. Actually, I'm going to try a fourth thing. Whoop, close the browser itself. And start it up again. If I now go back to the site I just visited, and wait for a while. And what happens? The site still can positively identify myself. This is just a way of demonstrating how difficult it can be to get rid of cookies. So, how can you mitigate it against these kind of uh, fingerprinting? One is to use a generic as possible operating system. I'm using Windows 8. Uh, to use a generic as possible browser. I demoed this with uh, Firefox. To disable JavaScript. And to use uh, private or incognito browsing. Well, to be honest, this is not really feasible. Uh, if you disable JavaScript, you more or less disable the whole of the World Wide Web. And as you've seen with a generic operating system and a generic browser, it was still possible to identify myself. So it's not really doable or realistic to uh, get rid of your own unique fingerprint while you are browsing. The second level, your local network. Currently, um, I'm connected to my personal hotspot and I brought a little gadget. 
This is a Raspberry Pi, uh, one of my favorites during uh, pen testing. Um, currently, it's connected to this uh, hotspot. I gave him the, the passphrase of the, the hotspot so it could, could log on. Theoretically, it's possible, uh, for instance, by using brute force or any other method to break into other people's wireless networks uh, without having the correct password. So now I've made it a little bit easier on myself it, so that it's already connected and now it's a node on the local area network. This machine here is connected to the same network so they're able to see each other. Usually, um, when you try to hide the, 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 the content of your communication, when you're communicating, for instance, with a bank, you use SSL encryption to make sure that nobody can eavesdrop on your conversation. You make sure that you have end-to-end -end encryption. It starts with the browser and it ends at the server. Uh, the issue with that is, is that it's fairly difficult to configure it configure at, the, uh, at the right way. Server administrators can make a lot of errors while they're configuring it, thereby reducing the strength of the ciphers, thereby sometimes even make it possible for attackers to uh, decrypt the messages in real time. So it's, even though sometimes you think you have a secure channel, it's still possible for attackers to listen in onto your con conversation. Even worse, sometimes it's possible for an attacker to downgrade your connection while you're thinking that you have a secure connection, you actually have an insecure connection. This is something I want to demo as well. Once again, it's all on a, a personal network, so nobody gets harmed while I'm doing my, uh, while I'm doing my uh, demos. This is an um, SSH session to my Raspberry, so Whenever you see this uh, black screen putty, I'm actually connecting to the Raspberry and all the commands that I'm executing, I'm executing from my Raspberry Pi itself. So now I'm in attacker mode, I'm one of the nodes in the network that this victim is currently connected to. So first I'm going to do a scan of the network, an ARP sweep, with Nmap. Uh, you all probably know Nmap, it's uh, one of the most popular open source uh, port scanners. I'm going to do a simple network scan of the slash 24 network I'm currently connected to. And you can see there are several nodes currently connected to my hotspot network. I just want to see what the network gateway is and the gateway address is 43.1. I'm the attacker, I'm the Raspberry. So my personal IP address is 0.146. The machine I'm going to attack is with the easy MAC address, 12345, and it has IP address 0.54. So the first thing as attacker that I'm going to do uh, is try to, to do an ARP spoof. I'm going to try to convince the victim machine not to use the official internet gateway, my hotspot, but to use the Raspberry as a gateway. So instead of all the traffic being routed from the victim directly to the internet gateway, I'm going to send all the traffic from the victim first to my Raspberry, thereby intercepting everything and hopefully modifying it. I'm going to do that with another open source tool, ARP spoof. I'm going to specify the interface, the target, 0.43.0. Five four, and I'm going to spoof the internet gateway. If I haven't made any typos, there we go. And from this point onwards, the Raspberry is actively attacking the victim, and I don't see a thing from the victim's point of view. So think uh, when you're connecting to a local network, for instance, when you're doing work at Starbucks or at your, at your work, that each node in the network is able to perform this kind of attack. Each node is able to listen in onto your conversation and can act possibly um, modify the traffic as well. To show a little bit of modification, I'm going to start 
another open source tool, which is called SSL Strip. And SSL Strip is a tool which actively uh, modifies the network. Each time it sees HTML traffic, it tries to rewrite uh, redirections for, for HTTPS to HTTP, thereby preventing the connection from upgrading from HTTP clear text connection to a more secure session. So once again, the victim doesn't see a thing while it's now using my attacker machine as a gateway, and my attacker machine is now currently modifying all traffic. So say for instance, I'm going to visit a bank. www.suncorp. The demo that I'm going to show has nothing to do with Suncorp. I could have used any other site which tries to uh, upgrade its connection. So once again, I'm not telling anything bad about Suncorp. This is just for demonstration purposes. I log on to the site and go to the internet banking login, which opens another window. And hopefully, there we go. Luxy Luxy. I'm going to enter my customer ID, my password, and my token. I'm going to try to log on, which is probably not going to work because I entered fake credentials, obviously. But if I go back to my attacker point of view, there we go. Um, and I'm going to see at the logs which kind of traffic it logged. I'm going to do a grab on, say, password is, for instance. And there you go. As you can see, because the connection was uh, clear text, the Raspberry was able to listen in a conversation and log my user ID, password, and token code. So the, the web banking site tried to upgrade the connection to a secure connection. You probably as a consumer thought that the connection was secure. It actually wasn't because that little machine was intercepting the traffic. And once again, as a victim, you can't see a thing. Yeah? Is the Raspberry Pi then communicating with the bank via SSL? Or is it still on the connection? It's a, exactly, it's a man in the middle. It isn't an endpoint. It also could be an endpoint and function as a proxy, but now it's uh, completely transparent. So it doesn't do anything else than modifying the HTML or HTTP traffic. But is the bank see a HTTPS request? No, actually the bank sees HTTP request. And um, it would be great, it is a kind of mitigation, if a bank or a site would not let you um, enter your credentials in an insecure fashion. <laughs> but um, as I said, I'm a, a penetration tester, and if you see how many sites allow you to uh, enter your password or credentials or whatever in an insecure way, almost everybody does. So this is a very effective way of getting a win. I'm not saying anything about that. <laughs> it's, it just, once again, it's for demonstration purposes. I could have used any bank. So, uh, mitigations. If you're connecting to a network, uh, either you're at your work network or either at working at, the, at Starbucks, be aware of the kind of network you're connecting to and be aware of the fact that each and every node in your network is possibly able to sniff and to modify your traffic. And you don't see a thing as a victim. Uh, as a server operator or as a developer, uh, you could theoretically uh, modify your code so that you wouldn't allow any non-secure connections to your website. Um, as a victim, if I had typed directly into my address bar HTTPS, it would have started an end-to-end -end encryption channel with the bank and the Raspberry Pi wasn't able to listen in on that conversation. It would see all the encrypted traffic, but uh, probably Suncorp has its ciphers securely configured, so it wasn't able to decrypt that traffic. 
at least not in real time. There is uh, an open source uh, plugin for most browsers, for Chrome, Firefox, uh, I think others as well, uh, which is called HTTPS Everywhere, and it is a plugin which helps you to actively upgrade your connection. It's a kind of mitigation for you as a user. Just on HTTPS Everywhere, they recently had an upgrade. There's now an option for HTTP nowhere. So if you're a bit paranoid, it won't actually allow any HTTP connection. Big plus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I didn't know that. So we looked at the browser, we looked at the local network. Uh, the third step is uh, our internet. And I say our internet because we're all part of the internet. Uh, one way of trying to identify oneself is by passive fingerprinting. This is a really effective method of just passively looking at all the traffic and looking at the IP headers, at the TCP headers and HTTP headers, and thereby trying to identify somebody. Um, because a lot of websites have uh, third-party includes. For instance, if you go to the Sky News website, it loads uh, all different kinds of images from advertising networks. It loads all kinds of different uh, third-party JavaScript includes, which means that my browser is connecting to a lot of endpoints. My traffic crosses a lot of hops, a lot of nodes, and each and every one of that hop is able to passively fingerprint my connection which means lots of metadata. Um, I wanted to clarify exactly what metadata is. I found an out clip of the Australian Attorney General. It's all right, Jody, I'm sure Frank, this is already told us. That's the one I was going to show you. <laughs> I think he has the, the, the most clear definition. If you hear him talk, I mean, <laughs> it's all clear what he means. Hopefully this works. The Minister said today it's not what you're doing on the internet, it's the sites you're visiting. Can you so hear this? Be the sites that you're, you're well, visiting. Well, it, it, it wouldn't extend to, for example, web surfing. So what, what people are viewing on the internet um, is not going to be caught. So it's not the sites you're visiting? Well, um, what people are viewing on the internet when they web surf is not going to be caught. What will be caught is the... Um, it is, is the is the um, web address they communicate to. Okay, so it's only, uh, sorry, the web address, if I go to an internet site, that will be recorded and available. The, the, the web address um, is, is part of the metadata. The website. The web, the, well, the web address. The, the electronic address of, of the website. Okay, but if I go to the Sky News website, the Australian website, um, uh, a more questionable website, that will be, is that what we're talking about here? Well, I, that, my, my, the, what you're viewing on the internet is not what we're interested in, and that's not what we regard. But you'll be able to see whether I've been to that website, or that website, or that website. Well, what we'll be able, what, what the security agencies want to know, to be retained, is the is the the electronic address of the website. When a connection is made between uh, a one computer terminal and a web uh, address, that fact and the time of the, uh, of, of the connection and the duration of the connection is what we mean by metadata in that context. But that is telling you where I've been on the web. Uh, what about social media? Well, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> well, there was this uh, quote. But, but to be honest and to, to place everything into perspective, um, Europe has data retention laws uh, which went into force in March 2006. So then it was also obligatory. Fortunately, April 2014, it was declared invalid actually. The US, contrary to popular belief, there are no mandatory data retention laws. However, if companies would decide to store your uh, metadata, the government can and will use that data for their own purposes. And Australia, um, who knows? Mitigations for leaking metadata. Uh, as a developer, try to minimize the number of uh, third-party includes you're using, thereby minimizing the footprint of the, the user. 
uh, as a server administrator, try to reduce the data intake. Do you really have to need an IP address for logging? Do you really need HTTP headers for logging? Uh, think about what you're storing, because everything can and will be abused. And with regards to uh, the Australian law, uh, try to vote for the party that uh, correctly represents your thoughts. Level four, the final level. Um, when you uh, go to a secure website, you're using uh, an SSL connection and then you use it for confidentiality. Everything you do is encrypted. But you also see sometimes a green padlock, thereby stating that you trust the issuer of the certificate. And how is it able that you trust the issuer of the certificate? You only downloaded, uh, in this instance, Mozilla Firefox from the Fire Mozilla website. You installed it, thereby trusting Mozilla. But when you trust Mozilla, you also trust uh, Mozilla trusting other companies that can trust other companies that issue certificates. And when you trust Mozilla, thereby trusting other companies that issue certificates, thereby trusting those companies that actually can issue the personal certificates themselves, you're really trusting a lot and a lot and a lot of people. And trust goes wrong. So it's really important that you know who and what you trust. Just by um, using a browser, you're trusting literally hundreds, thousands of other companies. And do they all have the same security standards and security safeguards that you really want to have? Know who and know what you trust. For instance, with this Mozilla, um, going back to the website, if you're going to look at the certificate store, so which kind of companies am, am I now currently trusting? Options. Certificates, bless you. So this is a list of all the different companies that you're currently trusting issuing certificates. That's quite a long list. And as you may know, for instance, for the, the DigiNoter affair, a Dutch company, disclaimer, I'm Dutch. Um, uh, that's an, uh, an issue where uh, the trust thing went wrong. So how are you able to signal to all the different users that a certificate is invalid, that a certificate should be revoked? There are currently two uh, ways of doing that. One is by using certificate revocation lists. This is a big, huge pile of certificates which either have been revoked or invalidated. And the other one is using an online certificate status protocol which basically means if I visit a site and the site shows me its certificate, it also has a URI in it, which I as a browser can contact and I can contact the certificate authority who issued the certificate and thereby I can ask, is the certificate still valid? Sounds a bit complex, it actually is. So once again, I, as a user, I, I contact a secure site and I start a secure connection. So everything is secured between the browser and the server. I get a certificate from the server, still secure connection, and then my browser starts an insecure connection with a certificate authority. And each and every time that I visit that site, I will contact a certificate authority, thereby telling the certificate authority that at that point in time, I'm looking at the site from the certificate. So for instance, say you want to visit naughtysite.com, obviously using a secure connection, you get a certificate from naughtysite.com and you will contact, with your browser, you will contact the authority that issued the certificate to naughtysite.com and you will tell them, I'm currently visiting naughtysite.com. So that's kind of a, uh, a privacy issue. And does it really um, increase your security? Well, not really. Because, for instance, if, the, uh, if my browser doesn't get a response from the certificate authority, my browser is asking, is the certificate still valid? If it doesn't get a response, it still thinks the certificate is valid, thereby invalidating the whole system. 
So this, this is something to think about, that most browsers are currently out of the box configured to each and every time you're visiting a site, contact the certificate authority and telling you, or telling them actually, that you're visiting that site. It's a big privacy risk. By the way, Google uh, Chrome turned off that feature as one of the first uh, browser vendors, I think, a while ago, I don't know exactly. But major browsers such as Firefox and Internet Explorer still have this uh, issue by default. When the Snowden revelations were made, one of the revelations was that um, the NSA was snooping in onto the, the traffic between Google data centers. The, Google has several tens of maybe hundreds of data centers around the world, and they each communicate with each other during, using unencrypted links. And the NSA was smart enough to listen on those unencrypted links, thereby circumventing all the encryption that Google had in place. Google was obviously not amused uh, when they found out about those revelations. They embraced the impact and they started upgrading their security. They, now they have secure point-to-point -point links from, uh, from the data centers. Another thing they did was um, making sure that when you visit the Google site, that you go to the secure site, which is, I think, a good thing. But there's a little quirk. I'm going to look at Wireshark again. And by the way, if you look, you see the first few requests are all online certificate status protocol requests. I visited a certain site. I just demoed it with uh, Sumcorp. And my browser was sending out uh, to the provider who certified the party who issued the certificate that it was visiting that site. That's an example of the online certificate status protocol in action. I'm going to restart my session. There you go. Then I'm going back to my Raspberry. I'm going to stop my SSL strip application. It was still running on the background. I'm going to stop that. So it doesn't modify the traffic anymore. It can still listen in on the traffic, but it doesn't modify it anymore. And I'm going to visit a website. So I'm going to visit www.google.com.au. I don't use HTTPS before it. I'm just using the regular address. And what does it do? This is a beautiful example of security by design. I'm using the insecure uh, protocol, and Google by default changes it, upgrades it to the secure protocol. By the way, if I would still have had um, my SSL strip application running, it would still be HTTP. It would actively downgrade the connection. But I stopped that, so now you're seeing the HTTPS protocol. Let's say I'm going to search for a super secret site, super secret. I get various sites at the background. Um, let's see if I can do this two screens at once. There you go. At the left hand side you see uh, my network sniffer still at work, so it shows you all the traffic that's currently flowing through my network card. At the right hand side you see the browser on the same machine. The filter is for port 80, so I only see unencrypted traffic. So you won't see a thing while I'm currently browsing because it's secure traffic. It uses port 443, SSL encrypted traffic. If you're going to visit a site, which is a secure site, for instance, well, this looks nice. This is an HTTPS link. What would you expect if I click on that link? Well, hopefully, if everything goes right, you only see the online certificate status protocols. That's what I mentioned earlier. You see unencrypted traffic from my machine to the issuer of the certificates. I'm leaking currently information about myself. I'm leaking information that I'm visiting that website. 
but this is the only thing you see, right? So this is an example of a perfectly configured website where ev everything is using HTTPS. I'm going back to my search results. I'm going to restart my scanner so it's fresh and clean. What happens if I'm going to visit a non-secure site? Or what will be the first request that would you, you expect? Google Analyzer? So a third party include file on the side yeah. if they use Google Stats. Oh, sorry, no, I mean, when you click it, the first thing it does is go to um, a Google site to record that you click that. But, but I'm only showing unencrypted traffic and I'm using the encrypted version of Google. I'm going to look at super secret. But look what happens. Ooh, that looked like a nice site. <laughs> the first thing you see that my browser tries to contact is Google itself. Unencrypted traffic. So what actually happens? Even though you're thinking you're having a secure connection with Google, you're having a secure page, everything is encrypted, the search results are all encrypted, as soon as you click on a link to an unencrypted site, Google first reverts that encryption. It falls back to an unencrypted version of Google, thereby leaking all of your information on an insecure connection, and then you'll visit that site. Isn't that weird? This is actually the reason why this happens. This is the RFC on the, the HTTP protocol. And by design, a browser cannot send a referrer header if it switches protocols, if it switches from HTTPS to HTTP. So each time it switches protocols, your browser cannot tell from who the link is that you clicked. The referrer header will not be sent. What this means in practice is, if I go to a secure Google site, everything is HTTPS, right? If I click on a link to an HTTPS site, you don't switch protocols, so your browser is allowed to send a Google referrer header. The site knows that Google brought in a link so they can get money for advertising. But what happens if you visit a secure Google site, HTTPS, and the link is to the HTTP site? If Google would be honest, and it wouldn't change a thing, and you would click on the link, then your browser was instructed not to send a referrer and the, the Google would not get man, money from Google because you couldn't tell that the link was from Google. Google wants to make money of you. You are the product, Google is free. So this is a sneaky example uh, where it's very clear that you're the product with Google. I'm not saying Google is bad. I'm not saying Google is evil. I'm just saying this is, for me, a, a case of misdirection. You think you have a secure connection, everything looks Perfectly, your browser doesn't warn you that it's downgrading the encryption and still you're sending out unencrypted data to Google. There is a little workaround though, and that's by visiting the, uh, the lower URL, encrypted.google.com, and that site actually uh, preserves your privacy. But by default, even though you're thinking you're talking to Google in a secure fashion, you're not, uh, you're sending out your data unencrypted through the wire. So this is something you, I think, as consumers should know. <coughs> Mitigations for this problem, for this uh, specific Google example, if you're going to use Google, and to be honest, I still think it's the, the best search uh, engine around, you have um, better um, sites with regards to privacy, DuckDuckGo, for instance, start page, but let's be honest, uh, Google is the, still the one to beat. Uh, if you're going to use Google, use encrypted.google.com and never use the secure version, the www ver version. Uh, in structured browser, not to use the OCSP protocol. It's just a little tick box which you can use and which you can turn off. 
so thereby you're not leaking information to the certificate authority. Uh, a little bit more technical, um, there's a protocol called OCSP stapling, uh, which is basically a new way where the browser is not the one asking the certificate authority whether the certificate is still valid, but the site itself can do so. And thereby, you're not leaking any private information. And as a site developer, uh, please make sure that you use SSL TS standard for all of your websites. Make sure it's a default secure option. Lastly, um, how can you reduce your footprint? How can you stay more or less anonymous? Uh, you probably all heard of Tor, the onion router. These are just some schematics of how Tor works. Uh, the name already says it all. Onion router, it has different layers of onions and each layer is only allowed or can only communicate with the next layer and it's sending out encrypted packets from one layer to the next layer and it never knows the whole route into the network. So these are just schematic how it, how it works. If you're trying to um, send messages to, uh, from Alice to Bob, it routes your traffic for all these different nodes and all the, the traffic between the nodes is encrypted. So nobody can listen in onto your, com your conversation. Tor is a, an open source application. It runs on virtually all operating systems. And if you're really concerned about your privacy or whether somebody can eavesdrop your conversation, I really urge you to, uh, to experiment with it and use it for the good. Um, unfortunately, there are some hackers uh, who use it, which makes it difficult uh, for people who run Tor exit nodes, where traffic actually uh, gets routed into the internet, um, get more or less punished. So less and less people are running exit nodes because some people abuse the network. Lastly, if you're really, well, I wouldn't say paranoid, I wouldn't say smart. Well, let's put it this way. Um, this is the operating system that Edward Snowden recommends. Um, this is the operating system that uh, Bruce Schneer, the famous cryptographer, uh, recommends. It's a live uh, distribution. Um, it's called TAILS, the Amnesic Incognito Live System, and it completely runs off a live system. It doesn't remember a thing, and everything uh, you run from it is encrypted, so it never leaks out unencrypted information. It's pretty slow because it runs on the Tor network, but it, uh, it works. It makes you... Uh, virtually untraceable. So some uh, general recommendations with regards to privacy. Um, as a developer, as a site administrator, make sure that privacy and security is the only option. Don't let people uh, make the choice for themselves. Make sure that the choice has been made for them, the best, uh, the best solution. Um, let your voice be known, what you think of online privacy, what you think of governments that try to store all of the metadata. It can and will be abused. Uh, be aware of where you leak information. Be aware that your browser can be uniquely identified. Be aware when you leak information across your local network, across the internet, and spread the word on privacy. That's uh, my talk. Uh, last thing I wanted to, to mention, um, I showed a lot of, or not that much, I showed a few technologies which can be used to, um, to trace yourself. Uh, the Evercookie, for instance, and um, actively fingerprinting browsers. These techniques are, for instance, used by PayPal for fraud protection. So they're actually, there are good uses for them. It's not all bad. It's not the technology that makes things bad, it's the people that abuse the technology. That was all. Thank you very much. Questions, folks? Wait for the mic if you would. During the row last year about privacy, most people who didn't really think thoroughly said that if you don't do anything wrong, why should you fear that they listen in to you? The only best answer, I think, is that you might think you have done nothing wrong, but it's no longer you who decide if you have done nothing wrong. Right? 
they decide and they can on any whim decide that it is very dangerous what this person is doing and there's no way to get hold of anybody to reverse that. So that is the real threat. It applies to anybody. Second thing is that you can just trust these organizations because they are really control freaks to listen in and record and store everything you do. Yeah? Everything, all day long, all phone calls, all content, whatever the officials say. But what really frightens me is what are they going to do be after that? What are, are they going to process it, measure? We don't know, and even the whistleblowers I've been talking to from the NSA said that's where it is probably going wrong. At present, the systems fail. It, it, the, it produces nothing really, and they have admitted that they, they haven't found any terrorists. So it is for law enforcement, and it is f just for force to be in control of society. And that is a police state. And Who's that's not what we want. Yeah? So that is something we have to do something about it. It's not privacy or not. Is what are they going to do in these dark offices with the help of many hackers, by the way? It, it, it all starts out with... Um fear, uncertainty, doubt, governments trying to scare you into thinking of terrorism, child pornography, etc., etc. It, it starts out with all these premises and afterwards the databases might, will, will be used for other nefarious purposes. <laughs> well, here we are on center stage. <laughs> um, what uh, I think, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name now, the best uh, he, d he wrote a really good uh, refutation to that whole idea of uh, nothing to hide, nothing to fear, which is uh, a load of bollocks because um, otherwise they'd be walking down to the supermarket stark naked to buy their shopping every week. Um, when you go to work and you're talking to the boss in the office, uh, you're one kind of person, you're wearing a persona because this person has a degree of control over you. He has a certain power. Uh, you have uh, to project a certain kind of image in order to retain a level of uh, position in that company to keep on retaining that earning p uh, uh, potential uh, to keep that money coming in, paying off your mortgage, your bills, keeping your wife happy, your kids in school, paying your bills, your phone, your gas, all that sort of thing. When you go out of that office into uh, where your other fellow workers are, depending on how popular that boss is with his staff, you become that persona of yours changes again. You become another kind of person. At the end of the day, when... Uh, uh, your work day is over. You might go to the pub with a couple of those people that you're a little bit closer to and some other people in, in your general uh, circle and yet persona changes again. You become a slightly different kind of person. After a couple of drinks you go home and when the door's locked and the blinds are, and curtains are drawn with your uh, close family, your persona changes again and you become a different kind of person again. So here we have uh, different levels of privacy required by a person for self-protection uh, uh, and yet not one criminal act performed. You have nothing to hide, right? Yeah, nothing to hide. And I think, and I think uh, Bruce Schneier said it pretty well when he said that um, a requirement for privacy does not equate with a requirement for secrecy. So, yeah, that's, that's one point. And something else, I do a lot of writing. That's what I do for a living. Uh, so consequently, I do a lot of research. So um, I haven't used Google for years. I don't find that I've lost out anything by using a search engine called uh, DuckDuckGo, which is a lot more secure. Well, uh, 
in the, in the beginning, I had a little thing on, uh, on fret modeling. Um, the, the, the meaning of the t this talk is not to get everybody paranoid, not that you're scared of using certain technologies or things. I think it's important to be aware of uh, where you leak things. And sometimes it, it can be really good. I mean, how many of you have used Facebook and, and share all of your stuff online? That's, you know, that, that, that's good as well. Know where you share it, when you share it. So uh, you, you can use it in a good way as well. It's not all bad. The thing is we're getting scammed here. When you and I go to work and work for an employer, we work for a job specification that starts here and ends there. And if, for every moment of that employer's time that we are getting paid for, he is entitled to know exactly what we're up to. I have no argument with that. Uh, when we pay out our tax entitlement, we are paying for our politicians, our elected representatives, to work for us. We actively employ them. So this whole transparency Both. factor is around the other wrong way. We should know what they are up to for every second of our time. We are, you know, this, this whole transparency factor is around the wrong way. One more over here. Thanks for that, nice. Um, Back to a technical sort of question. Um, hide my ass, comparatively. Virtual private network. Yeah. Um, it's one of the mitigations you can use to um, to secure your net your traffic from your browser to another endpoint, VPN endpoint. What happens on the other side of the endpoint? It's part of a solution for a particular situation. Does that answer your question? Just throw it out there. Thanks. Any others? Comments? One more. One more before afternoon tea. Um, a lot of the um, preventions that you were describing um, are sort of at a personal level, adjust your browser settings or, you know, install stuff on your computer. Um, if you then wanted to secure a household, um, is there stuff that you can do other than running around to everyone's device? Because, um, you know, you have friends over, they use your Wi-Fi um, and their potential can be leaking stuff as well. So is there a way you can set things on your Wi-Fi router or IP tables on that to offer greater protection? Yes, uh, depending on your level of, uh, I want to say paranoid, but the level, depending on your level of what you want to achieve. For instance, you can uh, create, a, uh, you have distributions for a Raspberry uh, uh, Pi to make it a uh, Tor entry node, so that all traffic that passes to you from, from your home network will go through the Tor network. That, that is one of the solutions. Another one is using a um, HTTP proxy. Privacy is uh, one of the most widely used for that, to make sure that all of your browsers use that uh, proxy and that proxy filters out most of the attacks I've just uh, talked about. Privacy is really, really user unfriendly. You can try it, you can, it, it's better than nothing, but it's really unfriendly. Yeah, I'm just thinking it, like the, the one you're demonstrating with the internet banking, um, you know, we might know to look for, you know, the security sign on the browser or whatever, but my wife's probably not going to look for that. She's just going to put her details in. So rather than relying on her to always type in HTTPS, having something there that, um, you know, mitigates it in the first place. You can, you can use, for instance, HTTPS everywhere, those plugins that help um, a little bit on that on that side, and make sure your home network is secured properly. Yeah, I think like installing HTTPS everywhere, you're going to install onto every device, yeah. iPads, iPhones. It's still if you each and every client you need to protect. Yeah. So. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs>